to your we're going to ask that you be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus to Christ as this choir prepare to render a selection but before they come we want to ask that you will receive Reverend Allison this morning he's a pulpit helper he's a son of the church he's shown himself faithful over the years to Pastor Emeritus, and now to this pastor. And we are very grateful of his commitment to the word, his commitment to preparation, and his loyalty to the preaching of the word. So after the, so the choir has sung, the next voice you will hear is Reverend Tommy Allison. Amen. church say amen. amen how many truly believe that they can go to the Lord in prayer how many truly believe that you can go to the Lord in prayer that means you have a connection and if you have a connection then you can go to God in prayer and I know 
for myself that he will answer prayer. You know, I just have to look back in my life and see what the Lord has done. And I know he has answered some of my prayers. Amen. Amen. We do come to celebrate. And there is a word from the Lord. But first, let us give glory and honor to God, the creator, the preserver of the, root, the universe, and to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our counselor. To our pastor, happy second anniversary, pastor. We love you, pastor. On behalf of our pastor and our first lady and our first lady emeritus, Sister Rabina Gaines Flakes, love you, Mother Flakes. You're always dear to my heart. We, 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 we thank you for being here to all the members and the officers of the Fort Street Missionary Baptist Church. We're just glad to be here in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And I would be remiss if I would not recognize my beautiful wife, Miss Sandra Allison. I'm not going to ask her to stand because she'll give me that look, but I'm going to ask her to wave her hand. Amen. Amen. We thank God for her. And Brother Purdy, when we was coming down for prayer, Brother Purdy looked at me and I said, I'm going down. I, I, you know, <laughs> I hear you talking already. So I was delighted to go down and to be in prayer with her and her presence here. But there is a word from the Lord. We find in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, and I'll read verses 11 through 13. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 11 through 13. As Paul wrote, this epistle to the church at Thessalonica. It reads, verse number 11, Wherefore, comfort yourself together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. Verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace amongst yourselves. Amen. Amen. And I just would like to use as a title or a reference, Relationship Building relationship building. Pastor has been emphasizing the month of April as the love month. It is the backdrop, but the forefront and center stage we, that we celebrate his second anniversary, but we also celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ and his obedience in doing the will of the Father and that he laid down his life for us. For he said in his word, no man takes my life. I willingly lay it down. And if I willingly lay it down, I have the, what, the power to pick it up. So what does that say to us this morning? We must lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Not in the sense that we want to you, uh, 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 kill ourselves or give our life physically, but lay down selfish attitudes, selfish motives, Things that would hurt, harm, or 
bring divisions among the people of God and the church of God. For we know that the people of God and the church is those of us who sitting in the pews and not the bricks and the mortars. We are the ecclesia, the called out one, baptized believers in Jesus the Christ. We have a responsibility towards one another in the church. Today, on this grand occasion, not only again are we celebrating our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, we're celebrating our pastor's second anniversary and we thank God for him and his availability to the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in this present day and age. We are dealing with so much obstacles in this present day and age that if we're not under the leadership of an under-shepherd that is rooted and grounded in the word of God, we will be misled into a ditch that we can't find our way out of. So, so, so we thank God for a pastor who believes in teaching and preaching the, the theology and the Christology and the doctrine that Jesus the Christ had laid before the church to follow. As we begin the kickoff of what prayerfully is the foundation for this grand occasion that will culminate at 3 o'clock p.m., I would like to focus our attention on one of the epistles of Paul as previously read on the book of 1 Thessalonians to the saints at Thessalonica. And I'm going to just say this up front. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. I'm going to get that out of the way because that, 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 that's my pastor. You know, you're going to see some things from him in me. So I just wanted to get, get that out of the way. Because the apostle Paul was dealing with some issues in the church. It wasn't all gravy so to speak. But the Apostle Paul was not always an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he was a persecutor of the church that Christ had died and bled for. But Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And in that personal encounter with Jesus, he was transformed and became one of the greatest apostolic teachers of the New Testament. He had an encounter and there was a conversion, a transformation, which tells us in the church that when we have an encounter with Jesus, that should be an inward change, a transformation that takes place that will help us be connected to the source. And Jesus is the source. Paul's first epistle to the church at Thessalonica was written while he was at Corinth in response to Timothy's report on the progress of the church that they had recently established there on their second missionary journey under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thessalonica was named by Cassandra after his wife, Alexandra the Great, half-sister. It was known for its hot springs and situated strategically on the Via Ignata, the main road or main Roman highway that runs from east to west. It sheltered a harbor and it made an ideal naval station. The city was the natural center for traffic moving in all direction. In Paul's day, it was the capital of Macedonia. But today, modern day Salonikia, if I pronounce that word, you might have to just forgive me on some of these pronunciations, amen? But, 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 but as a military and commercial center, Thessalonica became famous for its wealth as well as its vice, 
attracting a strange mixture of Roman high society and pagan sensuality. Those were those who practiced polytheism. It attracted a strange mixture that was in the church. That could be a strange mixture in the Fort Street Missionary Baptist Church. We all have our own ethnic background. Yes, we are African American by race, but we all come from different cultures and backgrounds. So there is a mixture in the Fort Street Missionary Baptist Church. It also attracted merchants from other parts of the empire, including numerous Jews who believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Now, there are some believers here. I, I mean, anybody believe in Jesus in the house? I can't, I, I, just by observation, I see about 25 hands that did not go up. So that tells me what I needed to know, that I'm on, I'm on the right track because everybody didn't raise their hand. Is there anybody in here that knows Jesus? You're making it just a little bit easier for me, but I'm going to press on. The nucleus, center of growth or development of the church was formed from this group of Jews. Although 1 Thessalonians 9 indicates that the people, the apostles to the Gentiles, had his great success among the non-Jewish people of the city. Despite of all their accomplishments in establishing the church, Paul began to meet with resistance. After winning a few converts, his ministry in the city only lasted a month. Now, Pastor, I, I, I just had to put my, what you call, homiletical kickstand right there. Uh, uh, Paul's ministry only lasted a month. Pastor is on his second anniversary. Now, for some odd reason, I thought about my old Mustang 5.0 with five speeds. And that old car had the strongest gears is first and second. I mean, I could take off in first and second. And if you wasn't on the side of me, I'd leave you behind. And some of the, some of the members in the church just said, Brother Allison, you need to slow down. But when I would get to the first and the second gear, I was at the speed that I wanted to do at a takeoff. But in order for me to maintain and grow in speed, I had to get to the fifth gear. The third and the fourth gear would sustain me in the race. But when I would get to the fifth gear, I could maintain the speed and also accelerate to a higher speed and cruise down the highway from Colorado to Louisiana if I wanted to. The only thing I'm trying to tell you, Pastor, you're only at your second year, and you have taken off with a good start. But continue to look to the hills from which cometh your help, knowing that all your help cometh from the Lord, and get down to your cruising gear, and the Lord will take you on down the road to a higher path. Because we know that this race is not given to the swift, but to those who endure to the end. Now, during this time, Paul worked as a tent maker to meet his needs. And he stayed at the home of Jason, organizing the new believers into the church. But almost immediately, the Jews brought Paul before the politics, that is the rulers of the city. And let me tell you, it wasn't for no party. The rulers of the city went and got Paul and brought him to a meeting. Pastor, if you see a few of your deacons, you know, 
looking at you kind of strange with a few of them members and they want to bring you behind closed doors in the conference room, it ain't going to be all gravy. Because they expel Paul from the city. He's the one that established the church. He brought new converts to the church. But those that were in the church wasn't satisfied with him. In other words, they got rid of him. You can just look at some of the churches around the city. They're getting rid of pastors. You can look at some of the church across the nation. They're getting rid of preachers and pastors. You can look at churches all across the nation. They're getting rid of pastors. In the seven churches of Asia Minor, they were getting rid of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They had some issues that they had to struggle with. They had to deal with. And if all that was going on in, in the churches from the beginning to now, what makes you think that Fort Street is any different? There's some issues in every church. Pastor has to deal with them. He has to preach to them. He has to pray with them. He has to teach them. I was talking about evangelism the other day. Talking about catching fish. We go out to evangelize and we catch a whole lot of fish. But we bring them into the church and we don't clean them up. So what do you have? A church full of unclean fish. But I thank God for pastor because he believes in discipling. He believes in teaching. He believes in what God has called him to do. He's compassionate, trustworthy, and he loves you all. He loves the people, not only in Fort Street, but in the community. And he answered the call to whoever calls upon him. But everything is not a bed of roses. Now, roses are beautiful flowers. In the love month of February, they cost a lot of money. Our wives look at them and they want them. We got to send them on the job. We got to have them at home. My wife's smiling over there. She got her head down. But every rose has its thorn. And if you're not careful, you're going to get stuck. And if you get stuck, you're not going to say, mmm. You might say, ouch. And prayerfully, that's the only thing that come out your mouth. So what I'm saying is, my brothers and sisters, that as we come together in the church and we celebrate in God through Jesus Christ, we ought to maintain harmony and love with one another and show compassion to one another, to our pastor as he continues to lead and guide us under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They expel Paul from the city, not just the church. He went to Berea, meeting great success, but was again opposed by the Thessalonian Jews who dogged his trail and incited the people to riot against him, he barely escaped with his life. Just as a reminder, Pastor, Satan will sick his hellhounds on you. And they will never let up. They may not accomplish what they set out to accomplish, but they can put some stumbling blocks in your way. But I know that the God I serve and the God you serve, he, 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 he will make crooked paths straight. He will turn hilltops into straight pathways and valleys into highways. That's just the kind of God we serve. As Paul moved on to Athens where his message was received with little enthusiasm, he dispatched Timothy to check on the situation at Thessalonica. 
at the Thessalonian church. By this time, after all the rejection and the persecution of the gospel, Paul came to Corinth in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Pastor, I know sometimes the load get heavy and you feel that you can't bear it all sometimes. But let me remind you of the reframe from a hymnal by Roberta Martin. He knows just how much you can bear. It goes something like that. Though the load get heavy, you're never left alone to bear it all. Just ask for strength and keep on toiling. Though the teardrops fall, you have the joy of disassurance. The Heavenly Father will always, always, always answer prayer. And he knows. I said he knows. Anybody know? He knows. Hallelujah. God knows just how much you can bear. Say yeah. Say yeah. He knows just how much you can bear. And pastor, you know where that inspiration comes from. When Silas and Timothy returned bearing good news about the Macedonian churches, Paul was greatly encouraged and pressed forward with his work. But the Thessalonians were also reportedly having some difficulties. Gentiles, those who Paul went out to, to teach about the kingdom of God, that God has opened opportunities to all to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. The Gentiles, and especially the Jews, those who should have known better, were impulging Paul's sincerity, defaming him as a wandering charlatan who had deceived them. They were contradicting him, called into question his integrity, his character, and his commitment. Pastor, they just will not let up. They will talk behind your back, stab you in the back, say all kind of no good things about it about you, but we don't look at the rear view mirrors of our lives. We look into the windshield where God is leading us to a brighter and bigger path. They were confused. They had theological and doctrinal concerns. They were confused about the second coming of Christ. Some members worried about believers who had died before Christ's return. Isaiah 26, 19 says, The dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For the dew is the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53 said, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised and comfortable, and we shall be changed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Verse 53 says, And this corruptible must put on incorruptible. And the mortal shall put on immortality. First Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall ever be with the Lord. That's if you've been born again. That's if you believe. 
caught up in the middle of the air. Ain't that good news? That ought to be some shouting right there for a born again believer. Others in the church considered it unnecessary to continue working since Christ would return at any time. And I kept going back to that unnecessary to continue working. You know, sometimes when folk get saved and they work for about six months, they come to figure that it's all right for me to take a vacation until God calls me home. The laborers, the labor is plenty, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. Thank you, Pastor. But the laborers are few. What does that say? The only thing I'm going to say is take a look in the mirror. And we're going to move on. Others in the church considered it unnecessary to continue working since Christ would, not ret Christ would return at any time. But that day and the hour knoweth no man, not no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Work while it's still day. For night time cometh when no man can work. When it comes, my brothers and sisters, it's too late. We got to get it right right now. We got to be doing the work of the church and not just doing church work. That's why we need to be under a pastor who Bible-based, Holy Spirit-led, and mission-bound. We thank God for you, pastor. He believes and have a passion for teaching. And Bible study is at 5 o'clock on Sunday evening. It ends at 6. But because of his passion, it ends at 6.30, 6.15. Midweek service starts at about 7.25, he started teaching, and it ends around 8 o'clock, but he keeps on going until about 8.15, 8.30, right, right. because he has a passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to give it all to you. Right. We just have to be recipient to it and not keep putting them on the clock. When he stands up to preach and he's teaching, we ought to not be putting him on the clock. Because his compassion and his love for preaching and teaching and feeding the flock of God's people which the Holy Spirit had made him under shepherd. And there were others sinking back into the immorality of the culture. In other words, they were backsliding. Not to mention also there was a crisis in the leadership. Many were being offended by tactless elders. Now, I won't have to say that this about our elders. Ever since I've been here in these few in eight and a half years or so, our elders have shown me great compassion and leadership and what it means to be a, 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 a senior or at the golden age in the church. They have always led great example for our young children. And we ought to continue to appreciate them and to support them and to encourage them. Because I see them come during rain, sleet, or snow. They'll come through them doors, walking stick, cane stick, wheelchair, however they can get in, they're getting in. So we ought to always encourage them and show them love and respect. And we're almost done. There are just some of the, these are just some of the main, minor and major difficulties Paul faced at Thessalonica. So what makes us think that as we come to celebrate our pastor's anniversary, that everything is peachy cream? In Paul's conclusion, 
to the exhortation to the church at Thessalonica in, ch in chapter 5, he reassures them, encouraged them, and finally challenged them. In verse 1 and 2, he tells them about the second coming of Christ. It's something that he or they have no control over. So why be concerned and worried about something you have no control over? Just be ready. The term time and season is used in the context of chronos time, which is a specific time, and the time from, from, from a watch and kairos time is a time when God himself chooses to act. The word season doesn't represent season as spring, summer, winter, and fall. The, the season in this context represents the time that God himself will act. We sing the song, it's my season to be blessed. It's my kairos time to be blessed. We hear old folks say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on Kiro's time, God's time. He's always on time. Mark 1.15 says, reads and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel spoken by Jesus, God in flesh. Kiro's time. When God got ready to send his son into the world. To the unbelievers, be ready when he comes. He makes reference to a woman going into labor. When the cycle starts, there's no stopping it. Now, I know medically they can induce labor or they can prolong labor. But once the child begins to come, there's no stopping them. So when the trump is going to sound, there's no stopping it. We just got to be ready. Be ready when he comes. To believers, Paul continued to encourage them in verse 4 through 11 by telling them that there are, they are children of the light and that that day, the coming of the Lord, should not cause any anxiety or concerns among them. Just watch and be sober. Be sober is to be free from mental and spiritual drunkenness, from excess passion and rashness, confusion. In other words, be well balanced self-control, and be not tossed about every wind and doctrine. Be rooted and grounded in the teaching of the pastor, under the leadership of the pastor, and also study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Watch and be sober. Paul encouraged them to comfort one another, edify and build up one another. We are here to build up the church of God, to build up one another, not tear one another down, to build up and encourage the pastor, not to tear the pastor down and create hardship and headaches for him. We come to our text, and it's just going to take me a moment, and we'll be out of here. But Paul also includes verse 13, which reads, 12 and 13, as we beseech you, brethren, to know them that which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourself. As Paul gives the instructions in verse 11, he says, we beseech you. In other words, we ask you. You see, Paul realized that he can't make nobody do anything. Pastor realized that he can't make no one do anything. But by showing us through the word of God, through the preaching and the teaching, we have to be willing to be recipient and humble ourselves and submissive to his leadership. And most of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. One thing I can say about our pastor, he, and, and like his father, his passion for teaching once again surpasses all our expectations. And he doesn't mind to stand up right now and give you a lecture. Teaching you the way and the will of God. He loves pouring out what God has given him to those who are available to receive. To know them which label among you the word knows is widely translated. But in the context could mean have high regard for. Cherish and pay attention to respect, appreciate, to see their true character. How can we do that if we don't have relationship building? 
Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Jesus said in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of my sheep. And as Jesus asked Peter, he asked Pastor Flakes the third. Johnny Flakes the third, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Johnny Flakes the third, do you love me? Feed my lamb. Johnny Flakes, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Why? Because my people perish for the lack of knowledge. I hear pastors say my prayer is to know every member by name. We are an interrelational church, meaning that we involve children, youth, teenagers, young adults, middle ages, seniors, and golden ages in all aspects of our worshiping God. He prays that Jesus prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17 that we all might be one. That's all about relationship building one with another. But we have to know one another through fellowship, fellowshipping with one another, studying with one another, be involved in support of the ministries of the church, partners in Christ's care and ministry, evangelism, ministry. I'm not saying that we have to have a personal relationship with pastor as riding around with him in his car, hanging out with him, you know, going to the movies with him. I'm just talking about getting to know the man and the man getting to know you and we getting to know one another. And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. We talked a lot enough about the works that pastor does. I know pastor and first lady are going to be blessed monetarily and with gifts that we all, and that's all well and good. But let us also pay them with kind words, positive words, words of encouragement, words of commitment, words of support, words with substance. Most of all, tell them that he's doing a great job. Pat him on the back. Show him some true and genuine love. You see, the money and the gifts are going to be put in closets and pass away. But the words of encouragement is going to carry him through difficult times. After all Paul went through, after all the rejection and being ran out of town because of his love for Christ, he was still able to write a letter of exhortation to the church at Thessalonica. So my brothers and sisters, as I get ready to close, I close with the encouraging words of Paul. Now my brothers and sisters, we exhort you one another that we are unruly and comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that no one render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice, I say forevermore, rejoice in the Lord. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Prove all things, hold fast to which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the, very, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. One thing I want to leave you with, my brothers and sisters, that pastor comes to realize that the church does not belong to him. He, he realized that he can't make anyone do anything they don't want to do. He come to realize that the church belongs to the one who came down through 42 generations. He come to realize that the church belonged to the one that was conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary by the Holy Spirit. 
He come to realize that the church belonged to the one that walked the dusty streets of Palestine. The one uh, who came uh, healing the sick, raising the dead, and uh, making crippled men uh, walk. He come to realize that the church uh, belonged to the one uh, that was baptized in the River Jordan. And the one that a voice from heaven saying, uh, this is my beloved son uh, whom I'm well pleased. Have I got a witness this morning? Uh, he come to realize uh, that the church belongs uh, to the one on this day in biblical history. When they laid down palm leaves. And they laid down their garments and they had, and they yelled out, uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, which is interpreted, uh, please save me. Uh, I just come by to tell somebody this morning uh, that he went to a hill called Calvary. And they laid him down uh, and stretched him wide. Uh, they put nails in his hand uh, and put nails in his feet. Uh, and I'm so glad uh, that Pastor to come to realize uh, that the church belongs uh, to the one who they lifted up high and spread in him wide uh, and he died uh, didn't he died uh, he died uh, one Friday evening uh, before the sixth and the ninth hour didn't he died I said he died uh, but pastor come to realize uh, that the church belongs uh, to the one they put in a borrowed tomb and he stayed there all Friday evening, uh, all Friday night. Uh, and he stayed there all day Saturday and all Saturday night. But I'm so glad, I'm glad this morning uh, that my pastor come to realize that the church belongs to the one who got up early, early, early. Sunday morning with all power, all power, all power in his hand. Have I got a witness this morning? Can you say yeah? Say yeah. Oh, yeah. All power, all power to the church at 4th Street. Be comforted. Know that God loves you. And he died for you while you were yet a sinner. Amen. Be ready when he come, my Lord. Be ready when he come, my Lord. Be He's coming again so soon, everybody.